Chapter 13 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy. Chapter 13. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. 1 Samuel 7:12. It was a lovely Sabbath afternoon, still and bright. Elsie sat alone on the veranda, enjoying the beauty of the sea and the delicious breeze coming from it. She had been reading, and the book lay in her lap, one hand resting upon the open page. But she was deep in meditation, her eyes following the restless movements of the waves that, with the rising tide, dashed higher and higher upon the beach below. For the last half hour she had been the solitary tenant of the veranda, while the others enjoyed their siesta, or a lounge upon the beach. Presently a noiseless step drew near her chair. Someone bent down over her and softly kissed her cheek. Papa, she said, looking up into his face with smiling eyes, you've come to sit with me? Let me give you this chair. And she would have risen to do so, but he laid his hand on her shoulder, saying, No, sit still. I will take this. Drawing up another and seating himself there and close at her side. Do you know that I have been watching you from the doorway there for the last five minutes? he asked. No, sir, I deemed myself quite alone, she said. Why did you not let me know that my dear father, whose society I prized so highly, was so near? Because you seemed so deep in thought, and evidently such happy thought, that I was loath to disturb it. Yes, she said, they were happy thoughts. I have seemed to myself, for the last few days, to be in the very land of Beulah. So delightful has been the sure hope. I may say certainty that Jesus is mine, and I am his, that I am his servant for ever, for time and for eternity, as truly and entirely his as words can express. Is it not a sweet thought, Papa? Is it not untold bliss to know that we may, that we shall serve him forever, that nothing can ever separate us from the love of Christ? It is indeed Christ who is our life. He says, Because I live, ye shall live also. Thus he is our life. Is he not our life also, because he is the dearest of all friends to us? his own people. Yes, and how the thought of his love, his perfect sympathy, his infinite power to help and to save, gives strength and courage to face the unknown future. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In view of the many dangers that lie around our every path, the many terrible trials that may be sent to any one of us, I often wonder how those who do not trust in this almighty friend can have the least real, true happiness, where at my case I should be devoured with anxiety and fears for myself and my dear ones. But as it is, her father said, gazing tenderly upon her, you are able to leave the future, for them and for yourself, in his kind, wise, all-powerful hands, knowing that nothing can befall you without his will, and that he will send no trial, that shall not be for your good none that he will not give you strength to endure yes that is it papa and oh what rest it is one feels so safe and happy so free from fear and care like a little child whose loving earthly father is holding it by the hand or in his strong kind arms and you have loved and trusted him since you were a very little child he remarked half musingly yes papa i cannot remember when i did not and could there be a greater cause for gratitude no such love and trust are worth more to the happy possessor than the wealth of the universe. But there was a time when, though my little girl had it, I was altogether ignorant of it, and marveled greatly at her love for God's word and her joy and peace in believing. I shall never cease to bless God for giving me such a child. Nor I to thank him for my dear father, she responded, putting her hand into his with the very same loving, confiding gesture she had been wont to use in childhood's days. His fingers closed over it, and he held it fast in a warm, loving grasp, while they continued their talk concerning the things that lay nearest their hearts, the love of the Master, his infinite perfection, the interests of his kingdom, the many great and precious promises of his word, thus renewing their strength and provoking one another to love and to good works. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. 
ere another week had rolled its round events had occurred which tested the sustaining power of their faith in god and the joy of the lord proved to be indeed their strength keeping their hearts from failing in an hour of sore anxiety and distress the evening was bright with the radiance of a full moon and unusually warm for the season so pleasant was it out of doors that most of our friends preferred the veranda to the cottage parlors and some of the younger ones were strolling about the town or the beach betty had gone down to the latter place taking lulu with her with the captain's permission both promising not to go out of sight of home oh how lovely to see us to-night with the moon shining so brightly on all the little dancing waves exclaimed lulu as they stood side by side close to the water's edge yes said betty doesn't it make you feel like going in do people ever bathe at night asked lulu i don't know why they shouldn't returned her companion it might be dangerous perhaps suggested lulu why should it it's almost as light as day oh bob perceiving her brother close at hand don't you want to go in i will if you will go with me i don't care if i do he answered after a moment's reflection a moonlight bath in the sea would be something out of the common and there seems to be just surf enough to make it enjoyable yes and my bathing suit is in the bathhouse yonder i can be ready in five minutes can you so can i we'll go in if only for a few minutes won't you go with us lulu i'd like to she said but i can't without leave and i know papa wouldn't give it for i had a bath this morning and he says one day is quite enough i was in this morning said bob betty too i think and i say bet it strikes me i've heard that it's a little risky to go in at night not such a night as this i'm sure bob why it's as light as day and if there is danger it can only be about enough to give spice to the undertaking with the last word she started for the bathhouse and bob not to be outdone in courage hurried toward another appropriated to his use lulu stood waiting for their return not at all afraid to be left alone with not another creature in sight on the beach yet the solitude disturbed her as the thought arose that bob and betty might be about to put themselves in danger while no help was at hand for the rescue the nearest she knew of was at the cottages on the bluff and for her to climb those long flights of stairs and give the alarm in case anything went wrong with the venturesome bathers would be a work of time i'd better not wait for them to get into danger they would surely drown before help could reach them she said to herself after a moment's thought i'll only wait till i see them really in and then hurry home to see if somebody can't come down and be ready to help if they should begin to drown but as they passed her presently on their way to the water bob said we're trusting you to keep our secret lulu don't tell tales on us she made no reply but thought within herself it shows he doesn't think he's doing exactly right i'm afraid it must be quite dangerous but while his remark and injunction increased her apprehensions for them it also made her hesitate to carry to their friends the news of their escapade till she should see that it brought them into actual danger and need of assistance she watched them tremblingly as they waded slowly up beyond the surf into the smooth swelling waves where they began to swim for a few moments all seemed to be well then came a sudden shrill cry from betty followed by a hoarser one from bob which could mean nothing else than fright and danger for an instant lulu was nearly paralyzed with terror but rousing herself by a determined effort she shouted at the top of her voice don't give up i'll go for help as fast as ever i can and instantly set off for home at her utmost speed help help they'll drown oh they'll drown she screamed as she ran harold who was in the act of descending the last flight of stairs saw her running toward him and heard her cry though the noise of the surf prevented his catching all the words what's the matter he shouted clearing the remainder of the flight at a bound betty bob drowning she cried without slackening her speed i'm going for help he waited to hear no more but sped on toward the water and only pausing to divest himself of his outer clothing plunged in and buffeting with the waves made his way as rapidly as possible toward the struggling forms which by the light of the moon he could dimly discern at some distance from the shore faint cries for help and the gleam of betty's white arm as for an instant she raised it above the wave guided him to the spot harold was an excellent swimmer strong and courageous but he had undertaken a task beyond his strength and his young life was very near falling a sacrifice to the folly of his cousins and his own generous impulse to fly to their aid 
both bob and betty were already so nearly exhausted as to be scarcely capable of doing anything to help themselves and in their mad struggle for life caught hold of him and so impeded his movements that he was likely to perish with them meanwhile lulu had reached the top of the cliff then the veranda where the older members of the family party were seated and all out of breath with fright and the exertion of climbing and running she faltered out bob and betty they'll drown if they don't get help quickly what are they in the water cried mr dinsmore and captain raymond simultaneously springing to their feet the latter adding i'll fear they're drowned before we can possibly get help to them oh yes they're drowning now sobbed lulu but harold's gone to help them harold he's lost if he tries it alone the boy's mad to think of such a thing exclaimed mr dinsmore and edward in a breath while elsie's cheek turned deathly pale and her heart went up in an agonized cry that her boy's life might be spared the others also the gentlemen held a hasty consultation then scattered mr dinsmore hastening in search of other aid while captain raymond and edward hurried to the beach the ladies following with entreaties to them to be careful but fortunately for the endangered ones other aid had already reached them a boat that had come out from nantucket for a moonlight sail and from the shore a noble newfoundland dog belonging to a retired sea captain strolling along the beach with his master he heard the cries for help saw the struggling forms and instantly plunging in among the waves swam to the rescue seizing betty by the hair he held her head above water till the sailboat drew near and strong arms caught hold of her and dragged her in pale dripping and seemingly lifeless they then picked up the young men both entirely unconscious and made for the shore with all possible haste it was doubtful if the last spark of life had not been extinguished in every one of the three but the most prompt wise and vigorous measures were instantly taken and continued for hours hours of agonizing suspense to those who loved them at length bob gave unmistakable signs of life and shortly after betty sighed opened her eyes and asked feebly where am i what has happened but harold still lay as one dead and would have been given up as such had not his mother clung to hope and insisted that the efforts at restoration should be continued through the whole trying scene she had maintained an unbroken calmness of demeanor staying herself upon her god lifting her heart to his throne in never-ceasing petitions and in the midst of her bitter grief and anxiety rejoicing that if her boy were taken from her for a time it would be but to exchange the trials and cares of earth for the joys of heaven and the parting from him here would soon be followed by a blissful reunion in that blessed land where sin and sorrow and suffering can never enter but at length when their efforts were rewarded so that he breathed and spoke and she knew that he was restored to her the reaction came she had given him a gentle tender kiss had seen him fall into a natural refreshing sleep and passing from his bedside into an adjoining room she fainted in her father's arms my darling my dear brave darling he murmured as he laid her down upon a couch and bent over her in tenderest solicitude while mrs dinsmore hastened to apply restoratives it was not a long faint she presently opened her eyes and lifted them with a bewildered look up into her father's face what is it papa she murmured have i been ill only a short faint he answered but you must be quite worn out oh i remember she cried harold my dear son is doing well love and now i want you to go to your bed and try to get some rest see day is breaking and you have had no sleep no rest nor have you papa do go and lie down but i must watch over my poor boy she said trying to rise from the couch lie still he said gently detaining her lie here if you are not willing to go to your bed i am better able to sit up than you are and will see to harold his brothers are with him mamma said zoe standing by and edward says they will stay beside him as long as they are needed then you and i will both retire and try to take some rest shall we not mr dinsmore asked bending over elsie and softly smoothing her hair yes papa but i must first take one peep at the dear son so nearly lost to me he helped her to rise then she perceived that captain raymond and violet were in the room dearest mamma said the latter coming forward to embrace her how glad i am that you are better and our dear harold spared to us she broke down in sobs and tears 
Yes, my child, oh, let us thank the Lord for his great goodness. But this night has been quite too much for you. Do you go at once and try to get some rest. I shall see that she obeys, mother, the captain said in a tenderly sportive tone, taking Elsie's hand and lifting it to his lips. I think I may trust you, she returned with a faint smile. You were with Bob. How is he now? Doing as well as possible under the circumstances. As is Betty also, you need trouble your kind heart with no fear or care for them. It had been a terrible night to all the family, the children the only ones who had taken any rest or sleep, and days of nursing followed before the three who had so narrowly escaped death were restored to their wonted health and strength. Mr. and Mrs. Dinsmore and Elsie devoted themselves to that work and were often assisted in it by Zoe, Edward, and Herbert. Harold was quite a hero with these last, and with Max and Lulu, in fact with all who knew and heard of his brave deed, though he modestly disclaimed any right to the praises heaped upon him, asserting that he had done no more than any one with common courage and humanity would have done in his place. Bob and Betty were heartily ashamed of their escapade, and much sobered at the thought of their narrow escape from sudden death. Both dreaded the severe reproof they had reason to expect from their uncle, but he was very forbearing, and thinking the fright and suffering entailed by their folly sufficient to deter them from a repetition of it, kindly refrained from lecturing them on the subject, though, when a suitable opportunity offered, he did talk seriously and tenderly, with now one and now the other, on the guilt and danger of putting off repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, reminding them that they had had a very solemn warning of the shortness and uncertainty of life, and asking them to consider the question whether they were ready for a sudden call into the immediate presence of their judge. "'Really now, uncle,' remarked Bob on one of those occasions. "'There are worse fellows in the world than I am, much worse.' "'I am willing to admit that, my boy,' returned Mr. Dinsmore. "'But many of those fellows have not enjoyed the privileges and teachings that you have, "'and responsibility is largely in proportion to one's light and opportunities. "'Jesus said, "'That servant who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, "'neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes.' But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. Yes, and you think I'm one of the first class, I suppose? I do, my boy, for you've been well instructed, both in the church and in the family. Also you have a Bible, and may study it for yourself, as often and carefully as you will. But I really have never done anything very bad, uncle. How can you say that, Robert, when you know that you've lived all your life in utter neglect of God's appointed way of salvation? hearing the gracious invitation of him who died that you might live. Come unto me, and refusing to accept it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And having for years refused to believe, how can you assert that you have done nothing very bad? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Bob made no reply, but looked thoughtful, and his uncle went quietly from the room thinking it well to lead the lad to his own reflections. Passing the door of the room where Harold lay, he was about to enter, but perceiving that the boy and his mother were in earnest conversation, he moved on, leaving them undisturbed. Mama, Harold was saying, I have been thinking much of sudden death since my very narrow escape from it. You know, Mama, it comes sometimes without a moment's warning, and as we all sin continually in thought and feeling, if not in word and deed, as our very best deeds and services are so stained with sin that they need to be repented of and forgiven. How is it that even a true Christian can get to heaven, if called away so suddenly? Because when one comes to Jesus Christ and accepts his offered salvation, all his sins, future as well as past and present, are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Jesus said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. But, O oh, Mamma, I find myself so weak and sinful, so ready to yield to temptation, that I sometimes fear I shall never be able to hold out to the end. My dear boy, let that fear lead you to cling all the closer to the Master, who is able to save unto the uttermost. If our holding out depended upon ourselves, our own weak wills, we might well be in despair, but he will keep the feet of his saints. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 
to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Can they be in danger who are kept by the power of God? End of chapter 13. Recording by Amy. Chapter 14 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy. Chapter 14. My Father's House on High. Home of my soul, how near, at times, to faith's discerning eye, thy pearly gates appear. Harold and his cousins had scarcely more than fully recovered from the effects of their almost drowning, when Captain Raymond again received orders to join his ship, and it was decided that the time had come for all to leave the island. Bob and Betty received letters from their brother and sister in Louisiana, giving them a cordial invitation to their homes, Dick proposing that Bob should study medicine with him with a view to becoming his partner, and Molly giving Betty a cordial invitation from herself and husband to take up her residence at Magnolia Hall. With the approval of their uncle and other relatives, these kind offers were promptly accepted. Letters came about the same time from Lansdale, Ohio, inviting the Dinsmores, Travelers, and Raymonds to attend the celebration of Miss Stanhope's 100th birthday, which was now near at hand. Mr. Harry Duncan wrote for her, saying that she had a great longing to see her nephews and nieces once more, and to make the acquaintance of Violet's husband and his children. The captain could not go, but it was decided that all the others should. The necessary arrangements were quickly made, and the whole party left the island together, not without some regret, and a resolution to return at some future day to enjoy its refreshing breezes and other delights during the hot season. On reaching New York, they parted with the captain, whose vessel lay in that harbor. Bob and Betty left them farther on in the journey, and the remainder of the little company traveled on to Lansdale, arriving the day before the important occasion which called them there. <laughs> Mrs. Dinsmore's brother, Richard Allison, who, my readers may remember, had married Elsie's old friend, Lottie King, shortly after the close of the War of the Rebellion, had taken up his abode in Lansdale years ago. Both he and his sister May's husband, Harry Duncan, had prospered greatly, each had a large, handsome dwelling adjacent to Miss Stanhope's cottage, in which she still kept house, having never yet seen the time when she could bring herself to give up the comfort of living in a home of her own. She had attached and capable servants, and amid her multitude of nieces and grandnieces, there was almost always one or more who was willing, nay glad, to relieve her of the care and labor of housekeeping, taking pleasure in making life's pathway smooth and easy to the aged feet, and her last days bright and happy. She still had possession of all her faculties, was very active for one of her age, and felt unabated interest in the welfare of kindred and friends. She had by no means outlived her usefulness or grown querulous with age, but she was ever the same bright, cheerful, happy Christian that she had been in earlier years. The birthday party was to be held under her own roof, and a numerous company of near and dear relatives were gathering there and at the houses of the Duncans and Allisons. Richard and Lottie, Harry and May, were at the depot to meet the train on which our travelers arrived. It was an altogether joyous meeting, after years of separation. The whole party repaired at once to Miss Stanhope's cottage, to greet and chat a little with her, and others who had come before to the gathering, prominently among them Mr. and Mrs. Keith from Pleasant Plains, Indiana, with their daughters Mrs. Landreth, Mrs. Ormsby, and Annis, who was still unmarried. Very glad indeed were Mrs. Keith and Mr. Dinsmore, Rose and Mildred, Elsie and Annis, to meet and renew the old intimacies of former days. Times had wrought many changes since we first saw them together, more than thirty years ago. Mr. and Mrs. Keith were now old and infirm, yet bright and cheery, looking hopefully forward to that better country, that celestial city, toward which they were fast hastening and with no unwilling steps. Dr. and Mrs. Landreth and Mr. and Mrs. Dinsmore had changed from youthful married couples into elderly people, while Elsie and Annis had left childhood far behind, and were now the one a cheery, happy maiden, whom aged parents leaned upon as their stay and staff, brothers and sisters dearly loved, and nieces and nephews doted upon, the other a mother whom her children blessed for her faithful love and care, and delighted to honor. This renewal of intercourse, and the reminiscences of early days which it called up, were very delightful to both. 
the gathering of relatives and friends of course formed far too large a company for all to lodge in one house but the three aunt wealthy's and those of the duncans and allisons accommodated them comfortably for the few days of their stay or rather the nights for during the day they were very apt to assemble in the parlors and porches of the cottage it was there elsie and her younger children and violet and hers took up their quarters by invitation for the time of the visit but where is the captain your husband inquired aunt wealthy of violet on giving her a welcoming embrace i wanted particularly to see him and he should not have neglected the invitation of a woman a hundred years old dear auntie i assure you he did so only by compulsion he would have come gladly if uncle sam had not ordered him off in another direction violet answered with pretty playfulness of look and tone ah then we must excuse him but you brought the children i hope i want to see them yes this is his son violet said motioning max to approach and here are the little girls drawing lulu and grace forward the old lady shook hands with them and kissed them saying it will be something for you to remember dears that you've seen a woman who has lived a hundred years in this world and can testify that goodness and mercy have followed her all the days of her life trust in the lord my children and you even if you should live as long as i have will be able to bear the same testimony that he is faithful to his promises i say the same to you too rosie and walter my elsie's children she added turning to them with a tenderly affectionate look and smile they gazed upon her with awe for a moment then rosie said you don't look so very old aunt wealthy not older than some ladies of eighty that i've seen perhaps not older than i did when i was only eighty my dear but i'm glad to know that i'm a good deal nearer home now than i was then miss stanhope responded her face growing bright with joyous anticipation are you really glad to know you must die before very long asked max in wonder and surprise wouldn't it be strange if i were not she asked heaven is my home there my best friends my kindred dwell there god my saviour reigns i live in daily hourly longing expectation of the call and yet you are not weary of life you are happy here are you not dear aunt wealthy asked mrs keith yes marcia i am happy among my kind relatives and friends and entirely willing to stay till the master sees fit to call me home for i know that his will is always best oh the sweet peace and joy of trusting in him and leaving all to his care and direction who that has experienced it could ever again want to choose for him or herself and you've been long in his service aunt wealthy mr dinsmore said half in assertion half inquiry since i was ten years old horace and that is ninety years and let me bear testimony now before you all that i have ever found him faithful to his promises and his service growing constantly sweeter and sweeter and so it shall be to all eternity my soul doth magnify the lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in god my saviour then turning to mrs keith how is it with you marcia she asked you have attained to your fourscore years and have been in the service since early childhood what have you to say for your master now just what you have said dear aunt never have i had cause to repent of choosing his service it has been a blessed service to me full of joy and consolation joy that even abounds more and more as i draw nearer and nearer to my journey's end i know it is the same with my husband she added giving him a look of wifely affection and i doubt not with my cousins horace rose elsie with all here present who have had experience as soldiers and servants of jesus christ in that you are entirely right marcia responded mr dinsmore i can speak for myself my wife and daughter both ladies gave an unqualified confirmation of his words while their happy countenances testified to the truth of the assertion and milly dear you and your husband your brothers and sisters can all say the same remarked miss stanhope laying her withered hand affectionately upon mrs landreth's arm as she sat in a low seat by her side we can indeed mildred said with feeling what blessed people we are all knowing and loving the dear master and looking forward to an eternity of bliss together at his right hand the interview between the aged saint and her long absent relatives was continued for a few moments more then she dismissed them with the remark that doubtless they would all like to retire to their rooms for a little and she must take a short rest in order to be fresh for the evening when she hoped they would all gather about her again i want you all to feel at home and to enjoy yourselves as much as you can 
she said in conclusion. Play about the grounds, children, whenever you like. Her cottage stood between the houses of the Duncans and Allisons. The grounds of all three were extensive, highly cultivated, and adorned with beautiful trees, shrubbery, and flowers, and there were no separating fences or hedges, so that they seemed to form one large park or garden. Rosie and Walter Travilla and the young Raymonds were delighted with the permission to roam at will about these lovely grounds, and hastened to avail themselves of it as soon as the removal of the dust of travel and a change of attire rendered them fit. They found a Dutch gardener busy here and there, and presently opened a conversation with him, quite winning his heart by unstinted praises of the beauty of his plants and flowers. "'It must be a great deal of work to keep those large gardens in such perfect order,' remarked Rose. "'Dat it is, Smith, he said. "'But I've worked pretty hard me self, and my son shaky. "'He gives me von little lift, when he don't please too much in school.' "'Do you live here?' asked little Grace. "'Here in this garden? No, Miss. I live out the three mile in the country.' "'That's a long walk for you, isn't it?' asked Lulu. Nine, I don't box, miss. "'When I ish got things to bring, "'apples or potatoes or something else, "'I say to mine shaky, "'just ditch the harness on the horse "'and hang him to the stable door. "'Or if I got no things to bring, "'I tell the boy, "'hitch him up to the horseback, "'and then I come in to mine work and I tash. "'I don't have to walk, not this step.' "'How funny he talks,' whispered Grace to Lulu. I can hardly understand him. It's because he's Dutch, returned Lulu in the same low tone. But I can tell you almost all he says. His son's name must be Jakey, the shirt for Jacob. What is your name? asked Max. Henkel, John Henkel. I think you've all bees come to see Miss Stanhope be one hundred years old, isn't you? Yes, said Rosie. It seems very wonderful to think that she has lived so long. The children... Weary with their journey, were sent to bed early that night. Lulu and Grace found they were to sleep together in a small room opening into a larger one, where two beds had been placed for the time to meet the unusual demand for sleeping quarters. These were to be occupied by Grandma Elsie, Violet, Rosie, and Walter. Timid little Grace heard, with great satisfaction, that all these were to be so near, and Lulu, though not at all cowardly, was well pleased with the arrangement. Yet she little thought how severely her courage was to be tested that night. She and Grace had scarcely laid their heads upon their pillows, ere they fell into profound slumber. Lulu did not know how long she had slept, but all was darkness and silence within and without the house, when something, she could not have told what, suddenly roused her completely. She lay still, trying to remember the events of the last day, and remember where she was, and just as she succeeded in doing so, a strange sound, as of restless movements and the clanking of chains came from beneath the bed her heart seemed to stand still with fear she had never before in all her short life felt so terrified and helpless what can it be she asked herself an escaped criminal a murderer or maniac from an insane asylum i suppose for who else would wear a clanking chain and what can he want here but to kill gracie and me i suppose he got in the house before they shut the doors for the night and hid under the bed till everybody should be fast asleep, meaning to begin then to murder and rob. Oh, I do wish I'd looked under the bed while all the gentlemen were about, to catch him and keep him from hurting us. But now what shall I do? If I try to get out of the bed, he'll catch hold of my foot and kill me before anybody can come, and if I scream for help, he'll do the same. The best plan is to lie as quiet as I can, so he'll think I'm still asleep, for maybe he only means to rob and not murder if nobody wakes up to see what he's about and tell on him. Oh, I do hope Gracie won't wake, for she could never help screaming, and then he'd jump out and kill us both. So with heroic courage she lay there, perfectly quiet and hardly moving a muscle, for what seemed to her an age of suffering, every moment expecting the creature under the bed to spring out upon her, and in constant fear that Grace would awake and precipitate the calamity by a scream of affright. All was quiet again for some time, she lying there straining her ears for a repetition of the dreaded sounds. Then, as they came again louder than before, she had great difficulty in restraining herself from springing from the bed and shrieking aloud in a paroxysm of panic terror. But she did control herself, lay perfectly still, and allowed not the slightest sound to escape her lips. That last clanking noise had awakened Elsie, and she too now lay wide awake, silent and still, 
while intently listening for a repetition of it. She hardly knew whence the sound had come, or what it was, but when repeated, as it was in a moment or two, she was satisfied that it issued from the room where Lulu and Grace were, and her conjectures in regard to its origin coincided with Lulu's. She, too, was greatly alarmed, but did not lose her presence of mind. Hoping the little girls were still asleep, and judging from the silence that they were, she lay for a few minutes without moving, indeed scarcely breathing, while she tried to decide upon the wisest course to pursue, asking guidance and help from on high, as she always did in every emergency. Her resolution was quickly taken. Slipping softly out of bed, she stole noiselessly from the room and into another, on the opposite side of the hall, occupied by Edward and Zoe. Edward, she said, speaking in a whisper close to his ear, wake, my son, I am in need of help. What is it, mother? he asked, starting up. Softly, she whispered, make no noise, but come with me. Somebody or something is in the room where Lulu and Gracie sleep. I distinctly heard the clanking of a chain. Mother, he cried, but hardly above his breath. An escaped lunatic, probably. Stay here and let me encounter him alone. I have loaded pistols. Oh, don't use them if you can help it, she cried. I shall not, he assured her, unless it is absolutely necessary. He snatched the weapons from beneath his pillow as he spoke, and went from the room, she closely following. At the instant that they entered hers, a low growl came from the inner room, and simultaneously they exclaimed, A dog! Somewhat less to be feared than a lunatic, unless he should be mad, which is not likely, added Edward, striking a light. Lulu sprang up with a low cry of intense relief. Oh, Grandma Elsie, it's only a dog, and I thought it was a crazy man or a wicked murderer. As she spoke, the animal emerged from his hiding place and walked into the outer room, dragging his chain after him. Edward at once recognized him as a large mastiff Harry Duncan had shown him the previous afternoon. "'It's Mr. Duncan's dog,' he said. "'He must have broken his chain and come in unobserved before the house was closed for the night. "'Here, Nero, good fellow, this way. "'You've done enough mischief for one night, and we'll send you home.' He led the way to the outer door, the dog following quite peaceably, while Elsie, hearing sobs coming from the other room, hastened in to comfort and relieve the frightened children. Grace still slept on in blessed unconsciousness, but she found Lulu crying hysterically, quite unable to continue her efforts at self-control, now that the necessity for it was past. "'Poor child,' Elsie said, folding her in her kind arms. "'You have had a terrible fright, have you not?' "'Yes, Grandma Elsie. Oh, I've been lying here so long, so long, thinking a murderer or crazy man was under the bed, just ready to jump out and kill Gracie and me.' she sobbed, clinging convulsively about Elsie's neck. "'And did not scream for help? What a brave little girl you are! I wanted to, and, oh, I could hardly keep from it. I thought if I did, it would wake Gracie and scare her to death, and the man would be sure to jump out and kill us at once.' "'Dear child,' Elsie said, "'you've shown yourself thoughtful, brave, and unselfish. How proud your father will be of his eldest daughter when he hears it.' Oh, Grandma Elsie, do you think he will? How glad that would make me. It would pay for all the dreadful fright I have had, Lulu said, her tones tremulous with joy, as but a moment ago they had been nervous and frightful. I am quite sure of it, Elsie answered, smoothing the little girl's hair with a caressing hand. Quite sure, because I know he loves you very dearly, and that he admires such courage, unselfishness, and presence of mind as you have shown tonight. These kind words did much to turn Lulu's thoughts into a new channel, and thus relieve the bad effects of her fright. But Elsie continued for some time longer, her efforts to soothe her into calmness and forgetfulness, using tender, caressing words and endearments. Then she left her, with an injunction to try to go immediately to sleep. Lulu promised compliance, and, attempting it, succeeded far sooner than she had thought possible. The whole occurrence seemed like a troubled dream when she awoke in the morning. It was a delicious day in early October, and as soon as dressed, she went into the garden, where she found John Hinkle, already at work, industriously weeding and watering his plants and flowers. "'Good morning, my little miss,' he said, catching sight of her. "'Is it so good a night with you?' "'No,' she said, and went on to tell the story of her fright. "'Don't ish me,' he remarked. 
phlegmatically at the conclusion of her tale. From the night I hear some things what makes me scare. I know nothing's what he is. I just hear a noise, and I jumped the bed out and ran the stairs down and looked the window out and wanted nothing's but a little dog going bow wow. I don't think it was very much like my fright, remarked Lulu in disgust. It couldn't have been half so bad. Well, maybe not, but that Nero is a good kind dog. He bite tramps, but never does nice little girl. This is the good day when does nice old lady be one hundred years old. What do you think? A very long time to live. Yes, very long, returned Lulu emphatically. I wish I knew Papa would live to be that old, for then he'd be at home with us almost forty years after he retires from the Navy. Somebody used to call you, I think, said John, and at the same moment, Gracie's clear, bird-like voice came floating on the morning breeze. Lulu, Lulu, as her dainty little figure danced gaily down the garden path in search of her missing sister. Oh, there you are, she exclaimed, catching sight of Lulu. Come into Aunt Wealthy's house and see the pretty presents everybody has given her for her hundredth birthday. She hasn't seen them yet, but she is going to when she comes down to eat her breakfast. Oh, I'd like to see them, exclaimed Lulu, and she and Grace tripped back to the house together and on into the sitting room where on a large table the gifts were displayed. They were many, and some of them costly, for the old lady was very dear to the hearts of these relatives, and they were able, as well as willing, to show their affection in this substantial way. There were fine paintings and engravings to adorn her walls, fine china and glittering cut glass, silver and gold ware for her tables, vases for her mantles, richly bound and illustrated books, whose literary contents were worthy of the costly adornment, and various other things calculated to give her pleasure or add to her ease and comfort. She was not anticipating any such demonstration of affection, not expecting such substantial evidences of the love and esteem in which she was held, and when brought face to face with them, was almost overcome, so that tears of joy and gratitude streamed from her aged eyes. They were soon wiped away, however, and she was again her own bright, cheery self, full of thought and care for others, the kindest and most genial of hostesses. She took the head of the breakfast table herself, and poured the coffee for her guests with her own hands, entertaining them the while with cheerful chat, and causing many a merry laugh with the old-time tripping of her tongue, a laugh in which she always joined with hearty relish. "'There is too much butter in the salt,' she remarked. "'It is some John Henkel brought in this morning. I must see him after breakfast, and bid him caution his wife to use less.' But as they rose from the table, John came in unsummoned, and carrying a fine large goose under each arm, bowing low. "'I ish come to bring two gooses to the one hundredth birthday,' he announced. "'They be good, peaceable pets. I ish know them for twenty years, and they never makes no troubles.' A smile went round the little circle, but Miss Stanhope said, with a very pleased look, "'Thank you, John. They shall be well fed, and I hope they will like their new quarters. How is Jake doing?' I haven't seen him for some time. No, Shiki is to go to school most days. I want Shiki to know some things. Yes, indeed. I hope Jakey is going to have a good education. But what do you mean to do with him after he is done going to school? Why, I think I brings my Shiki to town and hangs him on to General Schwint and makes a printing office out of him. A printer, John? Well, that might be a very good thing if you don't need him to help you about the farm or our grounds. I should think he would, though. Nine, nine, said John, shaking his head. "'Tis not so long as I want Shaky to make me a fence. Put I tash. Miss Stanhope, he say he don't know how. He can't do it. And I says, I tash, Shaky, you've been going to school all your life, and you don't know the way to make a fence yet. Not so very strange, remarked Edward with unmoved countenance, for they don't teach fence-making in ordinary schools. Well, then, the most pity, returned John, taking his departure. But turning back at the door to say to Miss Stanhope, I will put those gooses in one safe place. Any place where they can do no mischief, John, she answered good humouredly. Now, Aunt Wealthy, said Annis, what can we do to make this wonderful day pass most happily to you? Whatever will be most enjoyable to my guests, was the smiling reply. An old body like me can ask nothing better than to sit and look on and listen. Ah, but we would have you talk too, Auntie. "'When you don't find it wearisome. "'What are you going to do with all your new treasures, Aunt Wealthy?' asked Edward. "'Don't you want your pictures hung, and a place found for each vase and other household ornament?' 
certainly she said with a pleased look and this is the very time when i have you all here to give your opinions and advice and help added edward if you will accept it as i am tall and strong i volunteer to hang the pictures after the place for each has been duly considered and decided upon his offer was promptly accepted and the work entered upon in a spirit of fun and frolic which made it enjoyable to all whatever the others decided upon met with miss stanhope's approval she watched their proceedings with keen interest and was greatly delighted with the effect of their labors my dears she said you've made my house so beautiful and whenever i look at these lovely things my thoughts will be full of the dear givers i shall not be here long but while i stay my happiness will be the greater because of your kindness and the remembrance of these words of yours dear aunt will add to ours said mr keith with feeling but as old as you are aunt wealthy remarked mr dinsmore it is quite possible that some of us may reach home before you it matters little however as we are all travelling the same road to the same happy country being children of one father servants of the same blessed master and he shall choose all our changes for us she said calling each one home at such time as he sees best ah it is sweet to leave all our interests in his dear hands and have him choose our inheritance for us there was a pause in the conversation while miss stanhope seemed lost in thought then mrs keith remarked you look weary dear aunt wealthy will you not lie down and rest for a little yes she said i shall take it as the privilege of age leaving you all to entertain yourselves and each other for a time at that mr dinsmore hastened to give her his arm and support her to her bedroom his wife and mrs keith following to see her comfortably established upon a couch where they left her to take her rest the others scattered in various directions as inclination dictated elsie and anna sought the grounds and taking possession of a rustic seat beneath a spreading tree had a long quiet talk recalling incidents of other days and exchanging mutual confidences what changes we have passed through since our first acquaintance exclaimed annis what careless happy children we were then and what happy women we are now added elsie with a joyous smile yes and you a grandmother i hardly know how to believe it you seem wonderfully young for that do i laughed elsie i acknowledge that i feel young that i have never yet been able to reason myself into feeling old don't try keep young as long as ever you can was annis's advice it is what you seem to be doing said elsie sportively and with an admiring look at her cousin dear annis may i ask why it is you have never married it must certainly have been your own fault really i hardly know what reply to make to that last remark returned annis in her sprightly way but i have not the slightest objection to answering your question i will tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth i have had friends and admirers among the members of the other sex but i've never yet seen the man for love of whom i could for a moment think of leaving father and mother how fortunate for them elsie said with earnest sincerity i know they must esteem it a great blessing that they have been able to keep one dear daughter in the old home and i esteem myself blessed indeed in having had my dear father and mother spared to me all these years anna said with feeling what a privilege it is elsie to be permitted to smooth some of the roughness from their pathway now in their declining years to make life even a trifle easier and happier than it might otherwise be to them the dear parents who so tenderly watched over me in infancy and youth i know you can appreciate it you who love your father so devotedly but cousin horace is still a comparatively young man hale and hearty and to all appearance likely to live many years while my parents are aged and infirm and i cannot hope to keep them long her voice was husky with emotion as she concluded dear annis elsie said pressing tenderly the hand she held in hers you are never to lose them they may be called home before you but the separation will be short and the reunion for eternity an eternity of unspeakable joy unclouded bliss at the right hand of him whom you all love better than you love each other that is true annis responded struggling with her tears and there is very great comfort in the thought yet one cannot help dreading the parting and feeling that death is a thing to be feared for one's dear ones and oneself death is a terrible thing elsie not half so much to me as it once was dear cousin elsie said in a tenderly sympathizing tone i have thought much lately on that sweet text precious in the sight of the lord is the death of his saints and that other 
he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied and the contemplation has shown me so much of the love of jesus for the souls he has bought with his own precious blood and the joyful reception he gives them as one by one they are gathered home that it seems to me the death of a christian should hardly bring sorrow to any heart oh it has comforted me much in my separation from the dear husband of my youth and made me at times look almost eagerly forward to the day when my dear lord shall call me home and i shall see his face oh elsie cried annis i trust that day may be far distant for many hearts would be like to break at parting with you but there is consolation for the bereaved in the thoughts you suggest and i shall try to cherish them and forget the gloom of the grave and the dread for myself and for those i love of the parting they were silent for a moment then elsie said as if struck by a sudden thought annis why should not you and your father and mother go home with us and spend the fall and winter at ion and viamede i cannot think of anything more delightful exclaimed annis her face lighting up with pleasure and i believe it would be for their health to escape the winter in our severe climate for they are both subject to colds and rheumatism at that season then you will persuade them if i can elsie how kind in you to give the invitation not at all annis for in so doing i seek my own gratification as well as theirs and yours elsie answered with earnest sincerity we purpose going from here to ion and from there to the Amid, perhaps two months later to spend the remainder of the winter and you and your father and mother will find plenty of room and a warm welcome in both places i know it elsie anna said i know you would not say so if it were not entirely true and i feel certain of a great deal of enjoyment in your loved society if father and mother accept your kind invitation while these two conversed together thus in the grounds a grand banquet was in course of preparation in miss stanhope's house under the supervision of our old friends may and lottie to it elsie and annis were presently summoned in common with the other guests when the feasting was concluded and all were again gathered in the parlors elsie renewed her invitation already made to annis this time addressing herself to mr and mrs keith they heard it with evident pleasure and after some consideration accepted edward and zoe returned to ion the following day herbert and harold leaving at the same time for college the rest of the travelers the dinsmores and the raymonds lingered a week or two longer with miss stanhope who was very loath to part with them elsie in especial and then bade farewell scarce expecting to see her again on earth and turned their faces homeward rejoicing in the promise of mr and mrs keith that they and annis would soon follow should nothing happen to prevent end of chapter fourteen Recording by Amy. End of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley.